Well, I like, um, I really did not think I was going to make it to 22. Well, I, I cried on my 22nd birthday. Well, I, I cried to my sister for all because I did not think that I was going to reach 22. I got sober maybe six months before that. And so on my 22nd birthday, I really was profusely crying because I had no idea that I would survive this long. I've been through so many, like, near, I've been shot at, bro. My homies done got shot in front of me. See, my homie's dead body right in front of me. Um, my homies, I, I overdosed. Been into, like, severe car crash on top of the car, flipping three, diff four different times. Uh, so many near-death experiences anyways. But I'm here. But I'm here. But I'm here. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of Talk Ya Haq, the podcast where we discuss those relevant truths impacting us as Muslim youth. I'm your host Idris. And I'm your other host Abdi Kareem. And we got our brother, a very, very special guest in the building. Assalamu alaikum, my guy. Abdurrahman Warsama in the building. Subhanallah. How are you living, my guy? Alhamdulillah, man. I'm good, man. We over here in Seattle, Washington. In Seattle. Hey, welcome, oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah. Man, isn't it crazy how things play out? Because mm -hmm. I remember when I was like, yo, let's do a podcast. This was mm -hmm. like in July. Mm -hmm. And you said, hold up, bro. I'm gonna, I'm actually going to be in town, inshallah. Mm -hmm. And alhamdulillah, you're here. Alhamdulillah. So I'm glad to have been able to link up, bro, and make this happen. Something yeah. that a podcast, a conversation that we need more of, you know? So, yeah. so first of all, bro, I want to talk about like, why are you in the city? But give them context, mashallah. If those brothers or those sisters who don't know about you, mm -hmm. mashallah, I know you're from Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. You're a brother who, Allahumma Badik, I've seen on YouTube while I was in Egypt, you know, sitting with Sheikh Omar Suleiman talking about your story, mm -hmm. talking about substance abuse, talking about the stigma surrounded around it, your story, your, your, uh, your, the recovery you experienced, and also the advocacy you're doing now. So, uh, but I just want to talk about the film that you're doing now in Seattle mm -hmm. and that you've been doing a tour around, what is that? Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, so the film is called uh, Kui Li Ilowe. Kui Li Ilowe uh, means the forgotten ones. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is a film that's been in the works for some time um, and um, I'm the producer in it, mm -hmm. right? So I don't have much of a major like film role in terms of like behind the camera stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't really know much about that, mm -hmm. uh, but I have a really good friend of mine named Hamish Sheikh who is the director um, and we came together kind of and and did this film together about mm -hmm. the opioid epidemic within the Twin Cities as a documentary. Right. Um, it's something we've been trying to do for a while. Mm -hmm. um, it started out as just conversations between me and my brother in like 2020 mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic, which is also when I started doing like advocacy around the opioid epidemic um, online. Mm -hmm. I was already doing it before, like in person, doing events and stuff like that. Sorry. But um, online really sharing my story and stuff like that happened during covid because um, there was a lot of people in the Somali community that were dying. Friends of mine, people I grew up with, I had family members struggling. And so we just we were like, yo, we want to do something like this. But, you know, film costs money, bro. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so uh, for two years, it was just trying to find, find funding for it. Mm. And alhamdulillah, when we found a little bit of funding, um, we I went up to Mohammed and we talked about it. And it just, just, just was a whole roller coaster. Um, alhamdulillah, we got our brother right here, Mashallah. Abdullah, who's a Mashallah. part of the crew as well. Okay. And um, we we kind of just worked together, you know what I'm saying? Um, literally pennies on the dollar. Uh, and, and alhamdulillah, it came out as a good production. Um, and we sent out the trailer and like put out the trailer, sent it out to a few organizations, different areas. And, you know, alhamdulillah, we're here. Right. Yeah. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Bro, like, I know that this was not an easy story for you to tell. Um, I remember you were talking I was listening to another podcast Because mashallah You've been doing other podcasts And stuff like that It's not easy to go over here And you know Tell your your story Of what you struggle with A lot of people bro Suffer in silence Somali community We don't talk about this mm -hmm. It's like we know It's a reality that's happening mm -hmm. But we kind of Ignore it And the more we ignore it the more it gets worse. It's like a wound that gets mm -hmm. worse. And you doing these things, like going on podcasts or you have your own podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Friday, Sundays. Friday, Sundays. Shout out mm -hmm. to them. You was on the GOATS podcast. Shout mm -hmm. out those brothers. And a lot about it, you guys are doing that work. And then now on top of that, you're doing the short film. So why is it important for you, bro, to not only have recovered and, you know, overcame those obstacles, but for you to double down? You're the co-founder and executive director of generation hope generation hope yeah and you guys are youth-led recovery organization right helping mm -hmm. 
combat this. You're a young yeah. brother. And I'm like, what? This brother out here doing these big things. Yeah. It's the definition of turning your, your trials into triumphs. Mm -hmm. So why was it important for you to not only recover, but to go ahead and put yourself in the forefront of these conversations? Man, when I got sober, man, I only had one friend that uh, was sober. Mm -hmm. uh, my boy Khadr, who um, is the co-founder of the organization. He got sober a year before me. Um, and uh, we ended up like, I wouldn't say having a fallen out, but he had to distance himself from me um, before I got sober because I was so triggering, right? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like I would be around him, I would be high, I would, you know, come up to him. And he's a close, close friend of mine before drugs and after. Um, and so when I got sober, it was just me and him. We didn't have no friends that was like on the same type of time. Um, and except for a few that were in the same type of process getting into it. Um, but in terms of like in a home, home city, just me and him at that time. And so right. really just, um, we didn't know who else, nobody else was talking about it. You know, um, we had a close friend of ours that died, um, in September of 2019. And before that, um, uh, we had already talked about doing something like this because my friend Khadr was already sharing his story. And he told me like, yo, Rahman, wait till you get a year sober. Because like, you know, let's say <laughs> yesterday I was over here, you know what I'm saying? Doing something with you, this haram, whatever it may be, you know, drinking, smoking, listening to music, whatever it may be. And then tomorrow I tell you, yo, listen fam, you gotta stop doing this, bro. Mm. It's not that it's not, it's, it's a bad thing to do. It's always good to talk about the truth, right? It's, it's called talk, talk your hop, but like, in terms of um, how is that person gonna receive you? Right, I remember listening to this um, this lecture on um, was it uh, advocacy or it was actually by a guy named Kamal Al Maki who was talking about like the six way six different aspects of like dawah and he was talking about it's like what you say, who you say it to, how you say it, then it's who you are, right? Who they are, and uh, what is the relationship between you two, right? Um, for the what you say. And who you are, they go together, right? Because what you say has to match who you are. Because if you're not practicing what you're preaching, who's going to listen to you? Then who you are and how you say it, how, who they are and how they say it, how you say it also connects, right? Because at the end of the day, Mahawai and the relationship between you two, because at the end of the day, it's like how you speak to them also has to connect. It connects to um, how we, uh how you speak to them connects to who they are or what your relationship is with them. How I speak to my mom is not going to be how I speak to my dad. How I speak to my dad is not going to be how I speak to my brother and vice versa continuously. And so when it came to that, he was like, yo, you got to stay sober for a year. I was like, yeah, for sure. Um, what happened that month from like August 2019 to September 2019 was there was a string of people that were dying in our community. Um, and I wasn't there. I was in Texas, you know? And so this is just this overwhelming feeling of guilt that you feel when you come out of a situation and then other people are dying from the same situation or struggling with it even at that fact. Uh, but when our close friend died, Allah it changed everything. Like, cause he was somebody that got sober a little bit before me, but he wasn't in Minnesota. Mm. He ended up leaving, he was in Europe. And so we would always talk to each other. He was somebody that when me and other weren't talking as much, he would always check in on me, call me, cause I was going through withdrawals, you know? Um, and so he knew that and he would check in on me. And um, a few months in, he, he died. He was only in Minnesota for six days. Um, and so that kind of changed everything. And we started just doing that advocacy, just trying to just make a difference. And had no clue what a nonprofit was. Never really understood this whole idea of advocacy or speaking out or anything. I think it was the sense of urgency that pushed me to it. It wasn't, it wasn't anything else. Um, when I think about why did I go out and speak about something that, you know, nearly killed me. Um, it's something that a lot of people would be like, damn, like, yeah, like I wouldn't do that. Mm. Uh, but I think it was more of the sense of urgency that really led us to get into that type of work because we understood that there were so many people dying. It was imminent. Mm. It was, I was literally going back for Genesis every month. I lived in Texas, but I flew to Minnesota in the six month span I was there, I think seven times. SubhanAllah. Every single time there was a Genesis. Right. People I know, people I grew up with, somebody I used to use with, somebody I was on the corner with. Um. I had family members that were struggling. So I was dealing with something called survivor's guilt, you know? And so for people that don't know, don't know what survivor's guilt is, it's when you survive from a traumatic um, situation that somebody else, it can even be somebody you don't know when they die from it. 
And so it could be you guys are together or it could be you guys are completely separate, right? And so for people that are in recovery, that's a very common thing where it's like you have your homies that you used to be posted up with and now they're dying from it. And it really has, a, a lot of it has to do with understanding the concept of Qadr, right? Understand why am I alive? What did Allah spare me? And, and and somebody else, you know what I mean? Their life was cut short. And subhanAllah, this is like, that's the, the whole idea of Qadr, right? Why am I here? What is my purpose here? And so uh, for my first year, that was really, you know, like my struggle. And, and it's what pushed me also to, to make a difference. You know, it was like that sense of urgency because you're like, oh my God, like there's so many people dying from this. Like there's so many people struggling with this. And it was people suffering in silence. Nobody was talking about this. People would die and parents would be like, their kid died from a heart attack. That's mm -hmm. true. Or they, or they died in their sleep. In their sleep. Mm -hmm. I've heard that a lot. I've heard that a lot So, so before, it's like, yeah. it's so common. Mm -hmm. But uh, people wouldn't bat a second eye. Bat an, bat an eye at all. Like, you know what I mean? They'd just be swept under the rug. And so we had to do something. You know, and the sense of urgency even increased during COVID because I was stuck at home. Everybody was stuck at home and everybody was just dying. So we had to do something. So we put out um, uh, a small, it was a video of uh, me overdosing uh, attached with a, a poem I call, uh, that's called Survivor's Guilt. Mm -hmm. And so that really was had a lot of shock, shock value to it because nobody knew what an overdose looked like, mm. especially if somebody looks like you. You look at the video, somebody overdosing, you're like, this is was crazy. Right. And it was real. It was, it was a real video my homie took of me. Mm. You know what I mean? We used to have this whole thing where we take videos of each other, you know, while we're messed up. You know, just to like clown each other the next day. Oh my God, yo, look at you. You was yeah. out last night. Yeah. Um, and so my homie didn't know, you know, uh, that I was literally dying. I flatlined that day. Like, you know what I mean? And so he didn't know any of that. It wasn't until he cut the video because he seen me on the floor geeking. And he was like, yeah, you know, like I got to call the cops. Right. But in the beginning, he thought I was just, you know, lit. Right. That's true. Like, I remember I was having a conversation with one of my cousins about like people who do overdose and stuff like that, how uneducated we are as like friends and also as parents and stuff like that, because mm -hmm. there's certain things that you can do to save that person. Mm -hmm. Like Narcan. Uh, Narcan, give them Narcan. You know what I mean? And it's like us, we're not really educated. So then that shame where you say it's guilty is it's like you can't really save my son or my friend died of overdosing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it's that lack of not having education of like, if this situation does happen, right, I can give Narcan and it could potentially save him, you know? So I do agree with you on that one where it's like, we don't really, we're not really educated in terms of like, like drugs is such a taboo thing. Whereas like, if let's say, for example, Idris, like if someone told me, oh, Idris is doing this, this, it would be so hard for me to believe this because I'm like, how dare he? I don't believe that he'll do that. So it's that ignorant that we have. It's like, like he's human at the end of the day. He can mess up and go through life in the way that life's supposed to be. But you just blinding yourself saying that, how could this be? How could this, 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 this? And you neglect, you know what? Denial this is a situation that we're in. Right. And I might need to educate myself just in case of like that day when he was overdosing or somebody else that lost their life. Right. It's like you ignore it. Mm -hmm. We we can't afford to ignore it, bro. Like like you said, we have people that are now. It's like, bro, all likelihood you have somebody in your family, extended family. God forbid, but it's a reality. It may not affect you directly, but it's gonna in some way. Yeah. The the effects of it may reach you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we act like it's not a reality because of why we want to. I don't know what is the mentality, bro. Is it like um, I know you talked about like a superiority complex, or you talk about how. I remember you mentioned, uh, it, they took it into like a, a YouTube short. I've seen it. Basically, you said, we all heard the hadith that the man is on the religion Allah of his friend. Khalil, yeah. Exactly. The, that you are the, on the religion of your friend. But then you also brought out the ayah in the Quran. What is wrong with you? That you do not help. That you do not help one another. Yeah. And so what is the mentality that's preventing, bro? That you see time and time again. That you experience firsthand. Because, mm -hmm. bro, like, to be honest with you, lived experience is so real. Like, mm -hmm. me and Abdi, even on the podcast, we had imposter syndrome. We was like, bro... We cannot, we don't feel comfortable. This is a podcast we've been, topic we've been wanting to have, but a lot we stayed silent on it. And that's the best thing I'm so thankful because it hits different when you have the lived experience of somebody to talk about their story. So when you are in that, living that, seeing that day in, day out, what is those issues, bro, like in terms of the mentality that is stopping us from, from progressing as For, a community? Or, or like helping people and yeah, stuff. Yeah, bro. Um, so like, I think you're talking more like on the religious aspect. I would Islamic, say so, yeah, right? kind of. Um, so, 
more specific to that, um, and I'm not really like, I wouldn't consider myself like a sheikh or like a very knowledgeable person when it comes to this realm, but just a little that I've learned from, um, you know, various mentors and teachers. Um, one thing that I think that really holds a lot of people back, um, first and foremost, in the ayat, al I mean, hadith al maru Ma'adini Khalili, uh, the, the, the term is specific term Khalil mm. is your closest friend. Closest friend. It's not sahib, mm. right? And this is a difference between that right. and the variation of right. the word. Right. Um, in the way of like, when you have a very close friend, which mm. you have something called mirror identity, mm. where you start doing the same things. You start saying the same Saying the same things right. because you're with them all the time. Mm. Yeah. So the idea of your closest friend, mm. you being on the same thing as them, it's because of that, right? Doesn't necessarily mean help, right? And so mm. you have somebody that was a very close friend of yours at a time um, that's struggling with something. And what you have to understand is you being with them 24 seven doesn't really, is not connected to helping them, yeah. right? You can help somebody in five minutes, bro. A couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Phone call. Phone call, checking up on them. Yeah. They're so like, I feel like people, sometimes they connect the two. And a lot of times it does have to do with superiority complex. I myself uh, can say, so I'm somebody that, I wouldn't necessarily say I grew up in the masjid, but very um, early into my teenage years, I, I refound myself in Islam, right? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know how to pray when I was 13 years old. The first time I learned how to pray, I was 13 years old. Didn't know how to read the al alphabet, didn't know Quran, all of that, man. My first time was 13 years old, my seventh grade summer. Um, and I was dumbfounded by the religion. Very like attached to it, you know, in the masjid every day with the homies, you know, and we used to always kick it at the masjid. We used to like, it was like the same thing every day. You know, we would get out of school, Literally before school, we went to a school. There was a masjid across the street. We would get off the bus. There was breakfast. We would leave breakfast in the winter and go to the masjid and pray at the masjid. You know what I mean? And 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 we would be over there. And it's probably was great, bro. But it, uh, overall, what I'm trying to say is that when you're young and you find Islam, oftentimes what happens is because of the either iman and the the, the feeling that you're, you feel, the sometimes high. you feel like you're kind of can disconnected from the rest of the world. True. Like I'm chosen by Allah, Allah guiding me for a reason. Everybody else is not guided. So I feel like better than people sometimes. Mm -hmm. It happens to a lot of people. That's true. Right. And I feel like that arrogance is comes from ignorance. Mm. Understanding what Hidayah means that Allah chose you for a reason, but that doesn't mean that you won't be misguided. Mm -hmm. Right. You can easily be just as misguided as somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um uh, so for a lot of times, I feel like that's what happens. That's an aspect for people. Another aspect is ignorance. Ignorance can turn into arrogance. When it comes to, uh, you know, um, other hadith of when it comes to like, you know, يَمْرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ يَنْهَوْنَ عَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ or this ayat or like, you know, like enjoying the good, forbidding the evil. I feel like some people take it to the extent where they, they, they people don't understand that as Muslims, how we're supposed to be soft to one another. Mm. We're supposed to be uh, lenient towards one another, right? That's what Islam is about. So when you have other brothers that are, you know, I feel like a lot of times, Islamically, sometimes what we do when we find Islam is we create these like social clubs and circles mm -hmm. and cliques right. where it's like, yo, like, yeah, I'm with the boys and we remind each other of Allah, but man, the idea of da'wah, right? is literally the foothold of Islam, right? right? And it comes from the word da'a, to call people, so what is wrong with you? You don't help each other and you know, there's people struggling, but you consider yourself too high to do it, right? Allah chose you and he guided you, but you know, you you're selfish keeping it to yourself. Uh, so how do you, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, how do you feel about that? You're supposed to, we're supposed to be one ummah. Mm. You know what I mean? Where if, if one person feels it, another person's supposed to feel it. That's how deep our empathy is supposed to go. That's true. But it's like, you know, it's, it's sad, bro. and. Well, I, for myself, bro, like as a young teenager, bro, like I, I used to, be, I used to be the type where it was like, man, I remember like homies would be like, we so judgmental. That's crazy. Cause you know, well, lie, bro. If you don't be humble, Allah will humble you. You know what I mean? Cause you think you're too good for something. Right. Well, how you just start laughing at people, you start pushing them away. Easily like that, bro, it happened to you. You know what I mean? And so it's like, for myself, I, I believe I would like myself, people I was around young age, man. When you find Islam that first time, you feel that sweetness of faith, mm. sometimes so easily shaitan will get you from that aspect of like, yeah, man, you better than everybody else. Mm. You know, and that's your struggle. Mm. You know, and, and sometimes what happens with that is that a lot of times, bro, in the, these massages and these circles, man, you don't educate yourself or understand that that could have easily been you in those 
those shoes um, or that it's so easy to slip into the other side. Man, we get calls from everywhere, around the world, people from all walks of life, you know what I mean? And I feel like addiction is one of the most humbling experiences because you understand how low life can get. Um, and not only that, from an internal perspective, but the, pers but the external aspect about how other people treat you. You know, me once being in the massages, man, you know what I mean? Like literally, bro, leading prayers and then coming into, I can't even come into the massages now. I go into the masjid, bro, and you know what I'm saying? Like, bro, people look at you a specific way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You feel so weird coming in right. into a masjid. Bro, I literally have memories of me going into the masjid, bro. Like, my homie just got shot. Well, lie, it's a real story. Man, 2016, bro. October, my homie got shot three times. I go into the masjid, I'm praying. I go into Suju, there's a guy, his phone, he grabs it in the middle of prayer, bro, puts it in his pocket. You know what I'm saying? So, like, it's real life, like, experiences. It makes you feel uncomfortable. I know a lot of brothers like that, mm. where you don't feel comfortable going into the masjid or going into these spaces because of how people treat you. And alhamdulillah, I, I'm really grateful for that, I, the, for, thankful for my experiences with Islam at a younger age because I understood to differentiate the Islam from the, you know, the Muslim. Mm. Uh, but a lot of people don't don't get that, or mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and it's why so many people in recovery is really have a really hard time, you know, getting back into that foothold or trying to uh, connect Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala on a grander scale, you know what I mean, being accepted. And that's the whole idea of reentry. How do we accept Muslims back into this, right? Um, so many people are looking outward and not inward, and the whole idea of Islam is to look inward, mm -hmm. then outward, so, right? Who yeah. first? Come first. So I feel like that's it's a it's a very um very touchy subject very very like I could sit all day speaking on about that and how it impacts people because Islam is supposed to be what saves people but it's, uh, the sad fact is a lot of times we pushing them away mm. through Islam mm. and you're gonna be asked about that man you know that is crazy the last thing you just said we're pushing people away which we should be doing da'wah, we should be inviting people, calling people, but yeah. we're doing the opposite through our actions. Yeah, but that's yourself, is that really Islam? Yeah. Is that behavior Islamic? That The same Islam that emphasizes brotherhood and community and support. Yeah. And I think that's why, if you look at non-Muslims, the number one thing they gravitated towards is that, mm -hmm. is that community. I know Muslim Bilal, uh, I think that's his name, the one yeah. who does the nasheed, he even said, he's like, bro, you guys are the same ones that accepted me and was welcoming me are the same one that was like, saying the worst things about me, mm -hmm. right? It's like, what happened to that same love? What happened to the same... So there's that two polar extremes that you see within our community. It's like they invite, and we have to do another podcast for our revert brothers and sisters. 100%. That is a huge episode topic, yeah. right? Where, you know, you invite them, but what after that? Yeah. But after that, now you're judging them because they got the tattoos or they come in and they still working through habits. Mm -hmm. And so we have this culture, this attitude that needs to be resolved. And I think a lot of it, bro, and mashallah, your brother, I know you're being humble, but a lot, you have a lot of knowledge, a lot of it. And I think that is what's really protected you. And a, a lot of people don't have that knowledge. Even those people who look like, oh, they're not, you know, having their own struggles outwardly, mm -hmm. they themselves are lacking uh, a lot of knowledge. Um, but mashallah, bro, you being so vulnerable, being so open, I want to get into that, but I want to go a little bit deeper, bro. And I don't know if you've talked about this specifically, but, you know, mashallah, you mentioned how you were, mashallah, someone who learned the deen and early t teenagehood and stuff like that. If you're willing to share, like, even not your personal experience, but what you observed, what is it that really pushes people to these substances, bro? Like, I know that a lot of us, uh, Abdi even mentioned, he did another podcast with somebody else, and he was really upset when he came up to me because someone was talking about like drugs and they were very insensitive about it, uh, substance. And he said, I would never do that. I would, well, look at you guys, da, 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 da. And he was very insensitive. Somebody who didn't really look into the nuance of this conversation, but somebody who has actually lived that experience. There's a lot of, you're for second, you're second generation, we're second generation. There's a lot of trauma from our families, the mm -hmm. stuff that they experience, our environment, the cultures that we see. And so it's not like people just are looking for a good time only, but it's, it's what they're trying to escape from. And I think that's what we need to address. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask for you, it's like seeing, and you have the sobriety Sundays, you've talked to other people who have overcome this. What is it that these drugs provide that these young people or older people are, end up falling into it for? I think so, um, on one perspective, right? Uh, looking at the, the case of um, a young Muslim individual that is a second generation immigrant. Uh, 
you have a a lack of a sense of home mm. where you're too Somali, you're too American, you're not religious enough, you know, but you're not turn enough. <laughs> so it's like identity crisis in every real, time. For real, you know, and that's happens with a lot of people. Right. Um, and it's from every aspect, right? It's figuring out where you fit in, mm. um, which causes a lot of people to, you know, kind of experiment. Mm. It's one thing, right? Um, on another side, our parents um, that came here from war, well, real war, we real war, you know. Like my mom, she came when she was fifteen years old. Mm. Her dad died, and she one day she, he was missing. She went looking out for him. Went with this Ascot lady. And while there is in the middle of the war, bro, it's 91, I believe. Um, she's in the middle of the war, bro. Goes out looking with this Askar lady, Bombalukutura, you know, they throw a bomb, they throw a bomb, lady blows up. And the um, debris and the shrapnel and stuff hits her, knocks out. She wakes up in the hospital just screaming her, mom, her dad's name. Um, and they said, you know, and that's how she found her dad died in the hospital. She woke up. The lady, subhanAllah, didn't make it, you know, but um, then my mom, that was the only reason why she was, she still, still still stayed in Hamar. And she ended up leaving my grandma and the family over to Kenya, to Mombasa. And that's how she made her journey to America. Every time I speak to my mom about this, or my mom speaks to me about this, she, that's the furthest she gets. She never, she never told me about like how he looked, her favorite memories with him. Mm. It never gets into deep about anything about her dad. It's my mom, bro. I'm 25 years old, right? So like, it's a, it's not a normal thing for most people, right? I speak to my A and I ask her like, A, like, tell me about the war. I remember one day I asked her, I was like, tell me about it. You know, she's like, if I get into this topic, I'm not gonna sleep at night. Masahane, will I, will I? So the idea of what navigating emotions is, mm. how do we navigate our emotions, right? So there's the from a from like a emotional level from a, having an EQ and like learning about this type of stuff. How do we deal with and navigate our emo emotions? And there's like the, also the Islamic side of it too, right? Um, which I feel like isn't spoken about enough, bro. Like, you know, we grew up in Duxi, bro, right? Or we went to Duxi. The first thing is like, we learned is Quran. That's it. That's true. My Arab, you Arab? No, nah, bro. You Arab? <laughs> I don't know Arabic, bro. <laughs> so like, so yeah. I look at the Kitab, do I understand it? Mm. All you learn is is, is Quran. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't you don't learn. You're not prepared for life, bro. Mm. You get taught the small fundamental things, right? Um, but that's it. But the you, wisdom's in it. The guidance, the hidayah in it. You, you don't not, have no access. No access to it, right? And so, and a lot of times, the reason why is because if you look at historically, Somalia wasn't a religious. You know what I mean? State. Mm. Post pre war, mm -hmm. people started learning about the dean and getting you see the videos. The if you yeah. see the video, how the woman, yeah, man, it was like, turn, man, right. it was different out there. <laughs> it was different. If you see it, yeah, it was like America, yeah. yeah. So it was very, very different right, right, area. Right. And post war, alhamdulillah, a lot of people mm -hmm. found Islam, yeah, but it was very, very surface level. Mm -hmm. A lot of these guys didn't go to you know Islamic schools, that's true. They went straight to America, opened up these duxies, and they were like, We need to save our kids, but the only thing they could teach them was Quran, that's true. And then we decided to mix that with culture. Yeah. So, you so, know, so a lot of people that have, they don't have that background. Um, long story short, what I'm saying is, is that, um, you know, there, you got the identity crisis, mm -hmm. right? People don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. Then you have on the other aspect, a lot of people are not equipped with how, what Islam truly is. Mm -hmm. How do you learn that? Right. Yeah. Um, and then on the other aspect of things is um, navigating these emotions, right? Of who who are we? How do we adapt to this world? Our parents never taught us that. Our parents themselves, you were just telling me earlier, was you. Yeah. They have no clue. Like they came here the same time as you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like they don't have no idea on how to navigate this world. They're just winging it themselves. That's true. One of the like quotes I keep with myself all the time is like, and my brother told me this is like, you know, and I think this is when I was 22 or 23 years old. He's like, do you know how, how it feels to be 23? Like, do you know what 23 is like? No. Mm. Like, but you know 20, how 22 is like, right? So yeah, do you know how 24 is like? No, you have no clue. It's like 23, maybe you have some, some experience, right? Because you're a day old, a day 20 into 23. He was like, but every single person does not know how their life is in that moment. That's all they know is that that moment and what the past was. But tomorrow, they don't know how they're going to operate. 
So like me being 25 years old, I'm just winging it, bro. Mm. You just winging it. We all winging it in life. That's true. Because we have, we're just operating as time goes on. You know what I'm saying? So like a lot of times people are just trying to learn how to navigate. We're not, we weren't given a handbook, you know? And so a lot of times people end up falling into addiction because because of all of these different things. I can sit down and speak about how many different ways, you know what I mean? It can happen to people, um, but it's like, what I will tell you is that addiction isn't the disease, it's a mm. symptom, mm. right? Addiction itself is a disease, right? But it's a symptom most of the time of something underlying, mm. right? That's so, untreated. True. Yeah. Right, it's like trying to cope with something that you have like you have no idea how to deal with. Mm. You know what I mean? Essentially, like what, what he was saying. I feel like for me, why I feel like people get addicted to drugs, it's surely enough just to get rid of what's happening in their world yeah. at that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, cause what he said, you'd like, you, you are only in control of what's happening now and you can only think of what you did in the past. Yeah. You can never change that. In the future, you don't know what could happen. And probably so people it's are like, hopeless about tomorrow. Exactly. So yeah. like with, when you, I was telling you about that whole conversation and it was like it being in that podcast and just seeing how that person was saying, I would never, I would never. And I was like, well, okay, let's say two years from now, God puts you in a predicament where you're put into the stress and you feel like like you're just by yourself into this creepy area of like in your head. And it's like the only way you feel like you can get out of it is doing a substance. You never know that could happen to you. You know what I mean? So that, but then I do agree with what he was saying, the fact that like there's so many different ways of getting into drugs. You know what I mean? There's the social media aspect of like seeing your favorite like uh, Molly Perkins said that was my, who was future. You yeah, know what I mean? he was just, bro. Molly Perkins said you saw people never do drugs, don't smoke nothing. Talk about Talk Molly, Molly Perkins said. Yeah. 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 Molly Perkins So it's yeah. like, and so it's it's glamorized mm -hmm. and it's pushed in our face. That's true. And the harms of it is not as much talked about. And what you talked about, the underlying aspect. Mm -hmm. of it, you feel me? And Subhanallah, I really like how you talked about how a lot of us, a lot of our parents, our communities don't have any prior knowledge and talking for one like you're big on having discussions and and going out there and shedding light on this i think that's half the battle it's like when you have a conversation then you give it context and then we can start working backward from there but if we act like it's not there at all mm. how are we gonna how are we going to recover from it and as men especially this is a whole nother conversation as men especially like vulnerability emotions Bro, that's a thing that really is not reserved. It's not a right that us men are allowed traditionally to experience. Yeah. And so being vulnerable to be able to discuss what you're going through and the mm -hmm. help that you need, mm. we're not allowed to experience it. We're not allowed to do that. And then so when somebody goes off, you know, and does something because he's, look, he's desperate. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you know what I'm saying? Now you're just ostracizing and pushing them even more. Like, mm -hmm. subhanAllah, man. And, you know, it's 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 really a calamity okay, that's, that is spreading in our community rapidly. I know there's new, I know there's fentanyl, there's a big thing, there's overdose. Mm -hmm. Like, you take a little bit of this stuff. And, oh, boy, and it's, it's getting bad out here, Super bro. Super addictive and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so, how, like, bro, from your experience, like, what do you think needs to be done to like prevent? Because I say prevention is better than treatment, right? Yeah. And I know a lot of the stuff that you're doing, the advocacy that you're doing, being open, I think it's a lot of that preventative thing. Mm -hmm. But it's also helping those people who are most at risk. Mm -hmm. So, man, I would say what needs, what steps are, because I know you have the organization, what mm -hmm. steps are you guys taking? Mm -hmm. And how do we get to this to improve? You feel me? So, um, first and foremost, um, you know, like, this is something that honestly takes a village. Mm. Growth can't happen without community. Right. Um, and so when it comes to addiction, mm. um, of course, prevention is better than a cure. And so it takes, there's different legs to this. There's different forefronts. Right. Right? So there's prevention and education, mm. teaching the youth about this, teaching parents about this, teaching community about this, so that how can we prevent this from happening? Mm. Then there's the other aspect that is, somewhat out of our control which is right people that are still struggling now okay now for this there's other legs right on one forefront there's something called harm reduction which is how can we do some damage control mm. okay this person is struggling maybe they don't want to change but how can we ensure that they live a healthy life 
right? So that's working with them, you know, making sure they get access to showers, making sure that they, um, and this is very taboo, but I think this is something that's also like a lot of Somali people have no clue of, right? There are Somali people that are getting HIV and AIDS because they're using needles and they're dirty needles, mm. right? And so making sure that they get access to something that's cleaner so that they don't end up getting like HIV or AIDS and dying from it, which is very, like, it's not just Somali people. It's people like all around the world that are, this is happening to. So that's a practice that I feel like um, a lot of people shy away from because they think that it's enabling, but it's it's helping them get access to something where they won't end up dying from it, mm. right? Because if you can you can get a bad needle or a bad smoking kit, mm. you can die from it. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one aspect, right? Mm. Then there's the other aspect of access, right? How can we provide access to uh, communities that have uh, disparities in resources, right? Or disproportionate access to resources, which is very um, common in uh, BIPOC communities, Muslim communities, immigrant communities, minority communities, because we have no idea. I dealt with addiction myself and I never knew what Suboxone was. Overdosed many times, never knew what Narcan was. I went through um, withdrawals, cold turkey for like a month, sick to my stomach. Um, and there's medications and things that are available where that can help you with that, right? Whether it's Suboxone, Methadone, Vivitrol, um, there's Narcan, Naloxone to help you with, uh, you know, if somebody's overdosing. So a lot of people don't know, but I had no clue about any of this until I started the advocacy, funny enough. You know what I mean? And it was crazy because I was uh, struggling in a neighborhood called Cedar Riverside where I grew up in. And I remember I met a lady who owned a clinic. Mm -hmm. It was down the street talking about, oh yeah, we got an addiction clinic right here. And I'm like, what? I, I never mm -hmm. heard of this. I overdosed on the same block. Wow. You know what I mean? So like I never, I had no clue. Mm -hmm. um, so the access part. That's true. Then yeah. there's, there's treatment, right? So like, okay, how can we treat these people? But that's a, a three to six months. So then there's, you know, working with people, putting them in group settings, getting them in rooms with people that are going through like, like minding things, how, working with a drug counselor, right? Helping them deal with their triggers. You know what I mean? Their cravings, figuring out why did they use in the first place, right? All of that happens in treatment, getting connected with a therapist, getting over your childhood traumas, right? Um, on the Islamic aspect, helping people through this, you know what I mean? Working with yeah, a sheikh or something like that, um, getting connected to your salah. So there's, when I say that it takes a community to, and a village, it takes a village, it's, it's a very true thing, right? right? Um, and then on the outside part of it, after somebody gets out of treatment, which is the most important thing, right? Is that how can we help ensure this person gets back into society, re-entry, mm -hmm. the re-entry part. How do we accept people back into community? Which is one of the hardest things, right? If somebody's struggling with addiction, mm -hmm. okay, now they got sober, yeah. right? There's very many things that they need. They need a job. Sometimes people need housing. Maybe they grew up in, they live in a bad environment. Yeah, that's true. Right, whether it's in their household or on the external part or they live in a bad neighborhood. Their, their neighbors are using, they got a dealer across the street. And so they need to get out of the environment. So they need housing, mm. right? People need a job. People need to be connected to a masjid, which is very important, right? So how can I get connected to a masjid, right? People just like, just walk in. No, they, they need to be connected to a masjid where it's like, and I think there's such a very, very like, very sad aspect when it comes to this is like, what are messages doing, yo? Mm. Nothing. You know what I was mean? literally just going to ask <laughs> what you. What are messages and doing? we're fun, bro, like if you look, every khutbah, they just kind of fund the message. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, where is the resources going, yeah. bro? Yeah, where exactly. is the resource? Where is the help? Where is the mental health support that counts? Mm. Like That's we need true. a holistic. Yeah. Because I was literally just going to ask him about mm. like, um, like have has he reached out to massages having like Narcans in their area or mm -hmm. like having like a, like a youth convention about drug addiction alhamdulillah so yeah over the past few years it's actually has changed a lot you know in, what I mean? in, in the community of minnesota mm -hmm. you got massages that are learning about narcan doing narcan change alhamdulillah there's a lot more access to like resources and funding available in minnesota because minnesota itself is um very very deeply embedded within the recovery and addiction community mm -hmm. there are scientific models in connection to yeah. addiction called the minnesota models one that is um, connection to the recovery community. Um, also, like um, Hazleton, if you ever heard of that, is one of the biggest treatment centers in the world. Was founded in Minnesota. Oh. So a lot of a lot of um, resources when it comes to addiction and recovery there. So because of that, uh, it gives like nonprofits, massages, uh, access to you know resources to help them do those type of things. Um, and so there's a few few um, 
massages that do that. But I mean, even then, that's like things like Narcan and uh, and, and prevention, but True. on the intervention method yeah. or the intervention aspect of it or re-entry, helping people get yeah, back into like society. education Not really much, but you, we do, do speak at like conferences. There's conferences. I'm speaking one at in a few weeks. Um, it's an Islamic conference in Minnesota. So there's they're they they're they're getting leaning into it. It takes time. Gotcha. But it does take a village. See, and the, the thing that like that frustrates me is the fact that it had to get to a lot of people dying for them to be like, well, listen now. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the frustrating part because it's like, bro, it's it happens whether you love to deny it or not, bro. It will happen to the closest person you know. Yeah, you know what I mean. Sometimes it's, it takes a tragedy, bro. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So the, the, that's the thing that frustrates me because I've, I've seen like a lot of things when it comes to like the drug world. I've seen like my own family member, my own, well, majority of my family members going through it and stuff like that. So, and it's like I never, nobody ever helped them. Yeah, you know what I mean. And like that's the thing that hurt me. I used to see like, like certain people talk about like certain people about my family. Like, oh yeah this woman does this or this man does this and da 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 they're ashamed da 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 and it was like and I, I used to be that kid that used to like I didn't know how to deal with it because I used to hate the fact that like that's what you think of them and it, that's not true because I live with them that's not who they are Yeah, you know what I mean so I, I understand that but what really frustrates me is the fact that like now I let it get Sonoya yeah. well why not then why not when you were seeing them go through this stuff, you kept quiet, you kept going through your day. I'm a good Muslim, da, 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 but you ignored a, a Muslim person crying out for help. Yeah, I think it's really hard. But like with myself, my first year of um, recovery, I remember like I had so much resentment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, bro, I was somebody that was, I considered myself very loved by community mm -hmm. at a young age, very accepted, had a lot of friends, always in the masjid, always hooping with the homies. Um, and like within the, a second, bro, like all of that was gone. Mm. Um, felt so ostracized, bro. I'm talking about, bro. I used to be posted up, well, I bumming on the corner, bro, mm. in the street, in the most notorious area of the Somali community. Like people pass through that every second. You will not not find a Somali person. There's always Somali people there. Everybody lives there. People go through there. People go there to get groceries. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like very very hard uh for me to move on from that at it during that time period um mm -hmm. and i think one of the biggest things that allowed me to to not only forgive people but mm -hmm. also like be more open-minded mm -hmm. is understanding that it's not that people are spiteful mm -hmm. or full of hate mm -hmm. people are just ignorant that's true you know yeah people like they just don't know Lack of they truly energy. don't understand how deep this really goes. Mm -hmm. um, and so really like why I speak, like if if, if you ever look through my page, 90% of my content isn't truly about addiction. It's about pain. Mm -hmm. Because pain is something that's universal. It's about different trials and tribulations that people go through and that's what people relate to it. Even if you never went through addiction, you can listen to it and be like, oh damn, I relate. Because the thing is, is that uh, pain is a universal language and so when people listen to those trials and tribulations they'll connect to it and then they'll understand oh damn like if your brother died and your brother died and you started going to the gym and he started like you know, doing drugs everybody else might see you as the junkie or the addict or the bum or whatever mm -hmm. but you know or, or him and but you'll look at him and be like i understand mm. because you felt that pain true and you understood that that could have took you a different way true do you get what i'm saying so yeah. like I think it's really just like people just don't understand and learning about this situation and l engaging with community. I've come to understand how truly ignorant people are and it's not a bad thing, but education is the key to that. And then after the fact that people really sometimes don't understand something until it happens to them mm. or, or on another level like that, it happens to their family member mm. or that it happens to somebody that they know or love right. outside of that. They can always talk until they really truly feel it. Right, right. You know. No, subhanAllah. People don't really care until it, it, it you can't ignore it no more. You can't afford to ignore it. Now it's in your face. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of people who are probably relatives as well, bro. Like us have relatives. There's another experience on the other side of that. Uh where it's you you are having your own struggles having to navigate this situation. How do you navigate? 
for us, we can't handle our emotions. So sometimes it's anger. Sometimes it's confusion. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's frustration. And also you talked about the different approaches. You said, you know, there's different, like there's treatment, there's reentry, and before that. And I know you said there's some people who don't want help. Like they don't want help right then and there at least. Because addiction, bro, it really... It can grab your soul in a way. I mean, it can't really grab your soul, but it grabs you, your body, your physical state. It just pulls you in. Yeah. And literally, because your brain becomes dependent on this substance. Mm-hmm. I remember I was talking to somebody, and this is what really shocked me. I heard somebody say this. Somebody said that he's like, when I hoop, I got to be on this drug. When I go to a movie theater, I'm like, I'm thinking it'll be this much better if I do this drug. Like, their happiness cannot be independent of this drug. Mm-hmm. And so it really grabs you. And I think when you're on the outside of that, you can't understand, you can't fathom that. Yeah. But for this person, literally it's, it's on another level. Mm. And so I think for relatives, we have a role as well. Like uh, for one education, but also we need to have some kind of network and support group where it's a discussions mm-hmm. uh, because it can show up in unhealthy ways. Anger is a big way, bro. You can become so frustrated. You don't want help. And then you can become disowned. It's like, bro, if somebody comes like, I don't like really like, how would you navigate? It's like, you have someone you love and you're trying to help. You're trying to, you're trying to help them. They ask it for gas money, but really they're using it for this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, and it's like, bro, what you want me to do? Like, I'm trying to help you. Here's the, here's the rehab. Here's the mental health. Do this. And they don't want it. And so it's like, it becomes a point where you feel kind of pushed away. You're like, listen, I'm trying to give you this help, but you don't want to take that. And so what would you say to those, to those families, bro, who are in that situation, mm-hmm. right? Because I think that is a large number of people who are in that That's situation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, so what would you say to them? So first and foremost, mm-hmm. what I would say is that whatever emotions you feel is valid, right? Mm-hmm. Understand that, right? Somebody literally asked me this question yesterday. Um, Bro, like, being frustrated is okay. Being angry is okay. That's normal. It's you're human, right. right? But I think it really boils down to the understanding that you can't change anybody. You cannot guide who you love. Mm. The person you love the most, if they don't want to change, they won't change. Right? But all of that is is on, in Allah's hands. Right? So, like, understanding that, yo, like, I can speak Somali, right? Yes. Yes. So before anything, right? Right. So it's in Allah's hands. You have to rely on Allah. Understanding that He will guide this person. Right. right? But you also have to right? Mm-hmm. You do the action right. and then you work. Okay. So now the question is, and then you, and you rely on Allah. The question is now, what is the action? Yeah. But the thing is, addiction isn't it's a multifaceted issue. And everybody, it looks different on everybody. Okay, so how do you approach it? Right now, I could sit down and speak about so many different situations and it will be endless, right? So it's like, the thing is, is first and foremost, understanding that your emotions are normal, Mm -hmm. right? How do you cope with those emotions is the question. Mm -hmm. How does it transfer? How do you deal with this person when you're feeling this way, Mm -hmm. right? Because it's already a fragile person and you want them to change, Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes what we do as family members is we make a situation about ourselves because the pain that we're feeling is so personal. Mm. You have a loved one that's struggling with addiction. And so then you're like, you know, I don't want to feel this way. So I'm going to make this go away by make changing them. It's, it's not something that like we do that's like conscious. Mm-hmm. It's that the fact that we're feeling so painful because our family member is struggling that we're like, okay, we need to make this pain stop because everybody's hurt. Mm. Right, so we take this initiative to try to force them to change, but it doesn't do anything mm. because this person is not like their heart is not in your hands, mm. right? So you have to understand that first and foremost. Right. Now, how do you deal with this person when they don't change? Mm. Right, is the question. Right, yeah. Right, how do you deal with exactly. this person when they're not ready to change? Mm. Right. Uh, over the past few years, we've seen in community is pre and post advocacy. Mm. Pre talking about this, right? Mm. You've seen a lot of pa- family members kicking kids out, mm. right? Which is one extreme. Right. You kick them out, disown them, right? Because of the frustration. Mm. Then you see post advocacy, or you say we should say post overdoses in the community, where you see a whole another lax, where it's like family members will literally let 
them do whatever they want, you know, kind of give them whatever they want. All of this to what kind of like help them in their in their eyes, which is really enabling, right? Like, oh, I, I'll I'll give them money and they'll go do drugs mm. in the house because at least in the higa right? So it's the other extreme, so the other extreme right? right? So the truth is, you have to find that middle path, mm. and how that looks for every single person is different, mm. right? Um, one, also like as family members, we have to understand who we are to this person. Going back to that whole approach thing, right? Who are you to this person and who are they to you? How do you deal with this emotion and how do you kind of off put it to them, mm. right? Because all of that is important. Exactly. Yeah. So really understanding, yo, when when should I take the bench and when should I be put in? Mm. It's really like it's really like what a lot of people I feel like struggle with mm. is that, yo, if I have a sibling that's struggling with addiction, they have a different relationship with everybody, mm. right? I remember my brother told me, he was like, Abdul Rahman, None of us have the same parents. Mm. We do have the same parents though. I'm like, yo, are you crazy? Mm. He's like, no, we don't. Because our parents treat us all differently. They have a different relationship with all right. of us. You get a different face from each each mm. uh, uh, each parent right. to each of your kids, right? right? So the same way, when I have a relationship with all my siblings, I don't have the same relationship with any of my mm. siblings. It's all different. Right. So you have to use that to your strengths. Mm. Okay, if you're the person that's like really, it's hard for them to, you, it's hard for you to deal with your emotions. You have to understand when to step back, mm. right? If there's somebody that is you're, they're closer with or they can connect with more, you have to put them in, mm. right? And mm. so it's like, really, it takes a community, it takes a village, right, to understand that this is something that, one, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm. And I feel like there's a big misconception when it comes to addiction and recovery, because earlier you said, you recovered. Mm -hmm. now, I re I'm in recovery. Mm -hmm. Recovery is a lifetime process. Mm -hmm. But I can relapse tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This is an everyday fight. Mm -hmm. Every day I have to wake up and make that active decision to stay mm -hmm. sober. But I still get triggers. I'm sober four years and three mm -hmm. months. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I still get triggers. Right. SubhanAllah, bro. Wallahi, be like, I, like, I, I know so many different situations mm -hmm. where like I could get triggered easily. Mm -hmm. But I have to be self-aware. Right. And fight that. Right. right? Because at the end of the day, if I don't, mm -hmm. right, then I can slip back into that. I know people 10 years sober, they fall back into it. So it's an everyday battle. Relapse is part of recovery, right? 95% of people within their first year of uh, recovery relapse. This is a known stat. 95%, that's a 5% margin. For every 100 people, 95% of people go back, right? So understanding that relapse is a part of recovery. Okay, if somebody gets sober, you help them, and they fall back into this. We get so frustrated. What should I do? Right. This is so hard for us to like, like understand that this is a disease. This is something that's so hard. And this is something that literally like you struggle with forever. This is something that you have to like, and it's like the, how I see it is like you were introduced to something that you never were introduced to before. You fell in love with something that you never were meant to love. And now it's on you for the rest of your life. And that is the struggle that Allah chose for you, right? There was a saying that there's not one believer in this world that Allah has not attributed a test for them, right? A sin that they're gonna struggle with, that it's easier for you. Just like good deeds are, like bro, like you could be the fasting guy, bro. Like bro, it's easy to fast for you, right? But for this brother, it's easy for him to stand up and pray at night, right? That's that's what well, Allah, he made it easy for people where it's like there's certain certain good deeds that are just easy. You got a brother, man, and his right hand doesn't know what his left hand gave. His left hand doesn't know what his right hand gave, right? Because he's just always giving. That's easy for him. Allah made that easy for him. So every single person, Allah made a bad for them of, 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 of taqwa or piety or, or amal that's easy for that person. And in the same way, on the test side, oh. there are sins that some people just struggle with. Mm. Some somebody's music, somebody's zina, mm. somebody is stealing. Mm. But I know some people, bro, grew up in nice households. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not lying, bro. Like nice households, bro. But they can't stop stealing. They can't stop scamming. Scamming is their thing. Mm. Their families got daycares, dog cares, all types of, you know, businesses, whatever it may be. But they scamming. Mm. They don't have to scam. But it's just, that's what they're struggling with. Right. So, and then there's another brother who maybe, you know, whatever. So mm. what I'm trying to say is that the same way that the, the doors of piety and the, the amal or the bab of, of to, to do good, 
some people it's easier and some people it's harder. For some people it's harder to wake up for Fajr. Mm. Some people it's easy to. So like, what what that means is, bro, like, it's going to be harder for some people when it comes to this issue than other people. And so every person is different in that aspect. So you have to take that into account. And more diff- more importantly, you cannot change anybody. What you got to ask yourself is, how can I help facilitate that change? What can I do? How can I help them in that in that process? You know what I mean? How you see it is like they're the driver. You know, what you can maybe help them do in you know, the passenger seat is, oh, you take that direction. Mm. You know, take a right. Mm. We're going to the same place. Let's just take a right. Gotcha. If they take a left, that's up to them. Mm-hmm. But you're still in the same place. Okay, I'm still here. Right. Mm. Helping them navigate that. Mm. Right? Because right. I think the thing, yeah. if you do end up, because what's the other thing? Abandoning kind of. Yeah. And I think that's probably the worst thing you could do for somebody who, is that's true that struggling is. with addiction because now they have this crutch which is addiction right mm-hmm. but then that becomes their only thing that they can now it's like i don't got nothing else mm. and so now the problem is exacerbated yeah now it's like, so now they really become codependent on now them. it's like at first you're doing the drugs you have a house maybe and then slowly work falls off and then mm-hmm. you know people are sending money but then they stop sending money to you you know i used to just drive through seattle and i used to see some like people on the street like you know, on drugs, on mm-hmm. substance. And I would be like, what, how did this person get here? Well, I, like in my head, like, I'm sorry. It's just, I have to admit it. I would, in my head, I'd be like, how does somebody end up here? And I know there's varying stories. I know there's varying experiences. Mm-hmm. But understanding that, damn, I mean, if you fall into this and then slowly by slowly, people start disappearing from you. Mm-hmm. And now this is the only thing. And now you feel completely hopeless. I know that's why you have that organization, Generation Hope. Yeah. And I think that's what, hope is the number one thing, bro, because if you got hope, you got something to aspire to. Mm-hmm. A lot of people who are on drugs, yeah, I feel a substance, it's because it's like the thought of tomorrow, they can't even think about it. The thought of the, what the future holds, there's no optimism. Yeah. And I think the deen, spiritually, it already has that in there. You have this goal of Jannah. You have this mm-hmm. aspiration of yearning to get close to Allah. That, there's that aspiration. But when your dunya is dark, is depressing, you feel alone. And then the one thing that you thought, was, which was forever, which is your family, mm-hmm. is stepping away from you. Then it's like, why even try at this point? Mm-hmm. Why there's no hope? Yeah. And now it's just a dark, deep, it's a pit. So. Because um, I, yeah. I, I I went, like, how do I say Like I was saying, with the when he was explaining, like, l- there's different levels of understanding how to help somebody. Right. I, like, when I was little, I used to think, like, that the drug that my family member is on, I used to think like that was their normal state. Like that was them normal. You know, like, oh, they're good. They're happy. Da, 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 da. I think they're normal. And then as I got older, I start seeing when they don't take it, they change. Like they become very agitated, very aggressive, abusive, whatever it is that, you know. And then for me, the way I used to think was, like, all right, since you're going to do this, this is what I'm going to do to myself. If you don't stop, I'm going to kill myself. But then and we got that dark. That's how it was for me. Mm. It was. It got to the point where I was like, "Yeah, that, I don't want to live." Cause I, bro, I purposely used to stay outside longer so I don't come inside home. You know, and now that he's saying that, now that he told me that, I'm like, did I go the wrong way about it? He was a kid, bro. You know, yes. when you were a kid, yeah, he was a kid. Right. Because I was like, I was like, man, did I go the wrong? Because I tried harming myself mm. for the benefit of trying to help them. Right. You know, mm. that's the emotion behind it, though. Yeah. Right. You know, and I, I really want to explain that and, and stress on that, bro. Like, there's no wrong way going about this. We humans, bro, mm-hmm. just like we're winging it, bro. Yeah. You know. Right. And this is impacting us so deeply. That's I think true. that's really one thing that I feel like overall, mm-hmm. like when we were talking about the whole idea, the blame game and stuff like that, bro. Like. Hala Nai, we want Uma, we want community. We're all struggling with this and we're just trying to figure out how to deal with it. And sometimes it comes out in so many different ways. That's true. But the truth is, is we're all just hurting, bro. And and, and it comes from this whole idea of like, also like, bro, we come from such a communal society. What happened to that? Bro, I remember growing up and man, my mom, if we ran out of sugar, we would go to our neighbor. Mm -hmm. I don't see that no more. The whole idea of like mm. help your neighbor and you know lift each other up mm. 
it is completely out the window because we live in such an individualistic society. Right. People people feel yeah. more lonely than ever, bro, now. Yes. Like, it's a study finding that. Like, I think there was a study that said, like, back in the 70s, it was like, an average man had, like, five friends. Like, five good friends. Now, bro, it's, the average is, like, one to zero, bro. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. think about that. Yeah. I think it's because... I, I blame social media, the whole idea of... Because social media can get you anything, bro. Yeah. A hold of any information, a hold of anything that you can desire. It's there for you. And it through social media, a false sense of connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we have to. And Masha, you're doing this where you're bringing people within my city. I haven't seen getting together around this thing. Mm -hmm. So having community gatherings, having community conversations, getting together, we need that. That's now, true. More than ever. More than ever. Will lie. I'm not gonna lie because mm -hmm. that opened my eyes. Where it's like because. Mm -hmm. I'm not like Alhamdulillah. Like one of my family members, they're doing better. Alhamdulillah. But it's like what you just told me. It was like, like I almost because like the situation that they're in, I had to think about it. Like man, like what have I done as to like conversating with them and stuff like that? How did I help them? What is it that I do? Was I judgmental really too hard on them? Yeah. But like one thing that makes me so proud is how they've changed. Alhamdulillah. You know. So it's like and. That that's the thing that I feel like I took out of this. Like that's why I was quiet a lot of times. I was just listening because it's like, bro, I go through like having family members that go through addictions every single day, and it's just tough because it's like, how do I, how do I help them? How do I do this? How do I do that? And it's like I'm just quiet listening. I'm like, man, did I do that? Did I do that correctly? Because hmm. like it just takes like a person to really understand like to having that self. Like just because you're not going through it, that doesn't mean that doesn't affect you. You know what I mean? Like that, like, so that's one thing that I had to understand is like, I know I'm not like, I'm not, a, how do I say? I'm not going through the symptoms that they're going through, but I can't be like, it's your fault that you did that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I have to, like you said, play your part and helping them understand, like it may not be right now. And that's one thing that, alhamdulillah, that I took away from this. With everything that you do, time will always heal it. Yeah. Don't be so eager to think in like you'll quit one day and then the next because like you're right. Like having a family member that's been ten years clean, they can go back tomorrow. I don't even know. Recovery is isn't linear, bro. You know? Yeah. And that's something that I just learned today that recovery is something that happens every single day. And I never had a conversation with them like recently about like how exactly are they doing On that with that whole thing. Like, is it still hard for you? Do you still think about it? Is it something that you ponder in your head? Yeah. And I haven't done that. That's something I like that I'm like, that opened my eyes. I'm like, whoa, bro. I didn't even check on them on that. I just think they're good. Yeah. But I, I don't know. Right. You know, you yeah. know, so I would say that like really check up on the people that you love, even though mm -hmm. I know like you think they're good and they're, you know what I'm saying? They, they've, let's say for people that did recover and check on them, see how it is for them. Cause I feel like that's something that I have to do for myself as well. Mm -hmm. Especially in that first year, bro. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm writing a book right now. It's called It Takes a Village. Mm -hmm. And it started from just conversations of, because one of the kind of negative things that comes out of like the work that I do um, is that a lot of people try to compare my recovery journey to their family members, right? They're like, oh, damn, you've been sober this long. Why can't my family member do this? Or, you know, things like that. Um, and it got me into this full like realm of self thought like yeah why did i stay sober where did that come from what was so different in my life mm. and over the summer that's all i've been thinking about and i think one of the biggest things alhamdulillah that allah placed in my life which is well i only by the design of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was i had a lot of mentorship mm. i had a lot of people that poured into me like like with nothing in expression of return um expectation a lot of people just poured into my cup there was a lot of people that um, that looked out for me, used to check in on me. Some people that I just met that year, mm -hmm. some people that I've made friendships for a lifetime, uh, mentors that still check in on me, probably not as much, but still, I had a lot of people that poured into me. Mm -hmm. And really like that whole idea of growth mm -hmm. cannot happen without a community. Mm -hmm. It's such a, bro, like, we're we left social, that. We're yeah. social creatures, we need that. Like yeah. Even our salah, bro, like we're supposed to be praying in congregation. Yeah. Salah to Juma, we all getting together. If you look yeah. at all this, it's like we're supposed to be doing things together because we're that human being. That's part of us. Mm -hmm. But we're neglecting that aspect of us. 
but bro i i have you know a really curious question that i probably should have asked earlier it's kind of you know you talked about change like you know that family member for you that change that switch that moment right Mm -hmm. or maybe those moments because i think for you you would say it's a you're continually to choose to recover and to choose this path but i would ask like when because i'm i'm wondering like you probably had multiple points of like, okay, tried and then failed to try. Maybe a few times people have this like relapse and I think that's yep. what they call right? And so what was that switch in your head? What clicked for you? Um, and what is a, I know you might say that it's different for everybody, but I'm curious as to hear, what is that thing for the majority of people that tend to spark something in them? I would say it's different for everybody. Okay. Really, um, but I could tell you about for myself. For sure. Um, for myself, I think it was a little different. You know, you probably hear some like crazy story of like, oh man, you know, this happened and then I just seen the light. Um, but for myself, I don't think it was that. I think it was just the fact that I didn't want to die. Well, I like, um, I really did not think I was going to make it to 22. Well, I, but I cried on my 22nd birthday. Well, I, I cried to my sister, Father Ma. Because I did not think that I was going to reach 22. I got sober maybe six months before that. And so on my 22nd birthday, I really was profusely crying because I had no idea that I would survive this long. I've been through so many, like, near I've been shot at, bro. My homies done got shot in front of me. See, my homie's dead body right in front of me. Um, homies, that I, I overdosed. Been into like severe car crash on top of the car, flipping three, four different times. Uh, So many near-death experiences anyways. But I'm here. Uh, Alhamdulillah. And like during that time period, bro, like I feel like I truly, one of the biggest things was I just didn't want to die in the state that I was living in. That was the biggest thing. And I used to try to like navigate that. So there was a time period where I was around like you know, gangs and, like, people and stuff like that. Uh, The homies just banging or stuff like that. And so, like, for myself, I really, really, like, at first was like, yo, I need to get away from that. I need to stop getting, I'm getting into shootouts, people shooting at me, people trying to kill me. I don't like this. Before that, it was, like, jail. I was in and out of jail, which was continuous throughout that time, even afterwards, where I was like, yo, I need to stay away from the, the law. And then, I think what really started like was like when I was overdosing continuously. It was like, I'm talking about like every month, Um, like clockwork, I'd be in the hospital. Um, And I think at that point I was like, yeah, damn, this is getting bad. Mm. Um, And then- Were you afraid? Yeah, I was afraid of death, bro. I still am, bro. I think about it all the time. Mm. But I think it was more about like the state that I was living in. You know, I would literally like think, yo, I'm, I'm finna, I'm finna get smoked, as they say, right? You can get shot. Mm-hmm. Or I'm finna die from the, these pills, mm-hmm. right? Or something just gonna happen to me. And I had this overwhelming fear that, yo, like, this is how I'm gonna die, mm-hmm. um, which was so unfortunate. Um, and I just was like, yo, I gotta change. And I was continuously trying, bro. And it was like me trying different avenues. I would leave Minnesota. I left like for like a week and then come back. I tried like, I remember I tried becoming full on Sheikh mode, put on my khamis. I'm going, I remember there was this guy, Sheikh Abdurrahman Susil Doha. I'll go to his uh, Batuxi. He had on um, 38th, 36th in Hiawatha. I lived on 38th and like 23rd at the time. So it's like maybe like a 10 minute walk. I would go to him. It lasted like a week or two. (laughs) You know what I mean? Just praying all five. I'm doing all everything, just trying to navigate. So that 360 didn't work. But I think one thing that really helped me was prayer. I started praying April 21st, 2019. Um, and throughout that time period, I started making dua. And the dua that I was, well, I, every time, I with the way. Well, I make this black in my heart. Get out of jail, May. May 3rd, it was a Saturday. I mean, that was a Monday that day, May 5th. I had a homie named Noor, who was in Umrah at the time. And I told him, yo, bro, make dua for me. 
they got a lot, like, strays me away from this fitna or it keeps me strong inside it. Like, I'm going through this. He knew what I was going through. Made some extra thought for me. I don't know. Next day, somebody calls me. He's like, yo, let's smoke. It's the day before Ramadan. I go. <laughs> you know? I had the most outer world, like, horrible experience smoking weed. Like, I, I can't even sit here and explain it to you. Um, and it happened, like, six times. And every single time, it just was this feeling that I would get, like, I'm going to die. Like, super huge panic attacks that I never experienced before this. It never wow. happened to me. Wow. And it continued on until one day, like, I got so paranoid and, like, I felt so. And during this time period also, like, my homie overdosed. I almost got killed in front of my house. Um, mind you, this is all subhanAllah. May Allah forgive me during Ramadan. But I'm still trying, though. I remember there was one day that, like, I almost, I almost got killed. Layla to Qadri, where I'm off to peas, where I'm off to perks. And my mom didn't let me leave the house. And I really wanted to pray that day. Prayed in the house, high as hell off to perks. Oh Allah, make this easy for me. Oh Allah, make dua. Oh Allah, get me out of this situation. And I think really that Ramadan was what changed a lot for me. Um, although I was going through all of these different, like, um, it's crazy because I had my homie with me. Who was, he came to the crib and we ended up doing the perks. And he was just looking at me like, Nick, why are you praying? You know? But I think the biggest thing was for me was like, I really like, I truly honestly wanted to get out of it. I just didn't know how to. I had, I felt like I didn't have any hope. Man, I had ho old homies of mine talking about, yeah, bro, like, because I used to have these like little phases where I would try to go back to the masjid after something bad would happen. Or I would try to kick it with friends of mine, old friends of mine in the masjid. It would last maybe a couple of days and I'll be back on the block. So it was like very like a duality for myself where it was like I was really trying to change, but it only lasted for a few moments. It's a fleeting thought. Uh, it's really hard to stick, you know, especially when like you don't have anybody. I, alhamdulillah, I had one friend of mine who used to like, you know, be outside with us, whatever. And alhamdulillah, he changed his life like full circle. And he used to be only, bro, I know brothers I knew 10 years, bro, in the masjid, never reached out nothing. But his brother like, we knew each other, but we didn't get close until like maybe like 2016, 2017. And even then it was not like super, super close. But when he changed his life in 2017, this brother used to come to the block. Well, I only do I know ever in my life did this. He used to come to the block, talk to brothers. But we not fasting this Ramadan, bro. He would come to brothers, yo, come, come on, let me grab you guys some food. This brother's fasting, bro. Come walk with us, talk with us. And he used to reach out to me. Of course, the brother, you know, he'd get frustrated because I would be with him a couple of days. Like, it's frustrating. You know, you're on the D, you, you, you see a brother that, like, you know, trying to, trying to help him. And he's only with you two days. And the next day, you just see him out, outside with the homies and stuff. So, like, it was very frustrating. So, there would be times where he would, but he was young, just navigating life just like me. But I tell him all the time, bro, this is one thing that, like, it really gave me hope because this brother believed in me. You know what I mean? And there would be different pivotal moments in my life where I would talk to him. It'd be so emotional, bro. And I'll talk to his brother and he would really help me. And I feel like he, he, he gets it. You know what I mean? Even though he never went through addiction the way that I did or nothing like that. He never experienced the stuff that I did. But just because he was around me, knew me, and then he ended up changing his life. He was one brother that, even though there was brothers I grew up with, 10-year niggas, bro, that really, like, he was there and he was helping brothers. And so for myself, like, I really connected with him, connected with some other brothers. And, well, I spent a lot during that time period, bro, like, that was, that was what really helped that change and that flick of the switch because it wasn't something that happened overnight, but it was just that willingness to change. And when I told my mom one day, oh, you mentioned I need to go. Boom, it just, you know, and then the crazy thing is like a lot just step by step started adding different people to my life. There was a school I applied to while I was using, my sister went to, mm -hmm. called Qalam. And I know her teacher, Qalam is in Texas. her teacher, his name is Sheikh Mikael. Yep, I know him. Big mentor of mine. Yep. He, my sister was, uh, he, he was, my sister was back at school, but he was, he had a book called With Heart and Mind. Mm. And he was doing a tour and he's in Minnesota. Mm. I didn't know him from a canopy. Mm. My sister was like, yo, just please go. Yeah. So I was like, and this is during that, the, like, I remember I told you I had a, like a little religious phase. It's like March, I think. She tells me, go. So I go with my sister. I'm not really comfortable with my sister, so I got a bigger mama down. I'm in the corner. Brother just keeps picking on me, you know? So I'm confused. I'm my other sister's over there. I'm texting, she's texting me. I'm like, yo, like, do you, does he know that we're like father uh siblings or something? I'm like, yeah, I think he does. Because he keeps calling on me. It's weird. 
but he gave me like a good vibe and personality. So then we walk up to him at the end of the session. My, how did you know his father was a brother? And he's like, what? Your father was a uh, He had no clue. Subhanallah. But his personality mm. drew me so close to him wow. that when my sister asked me to apply, I just did mm. with no intention of going. Mm. Well, like, wow. months later, I end up going to New York to try mm. to change my life. Mm. And I get a phone call from them saying, mm. hey, we're doing an sp- interview, whatever, yada, yada. Mm. So they do the interview. It's just like you read from the Quran, whatever. Mashallah. And then that was it. Mm. I go to Philly. And I meet a brother named Yusuf Salam, who was exonerated from the um, Central Park Five. He got arrested. Mm. And another, another brother whose name was Tabari Zahir, who was locked up for 12 years. Mm. Two brothers who've been through, through some very extraneous uh, circumstances to change their lives around and not give back. And I spoke to the brother Tabari for a long time and I told him about my, my life and he gave me a lot of good words. And just very hopeful, bro. And I remember after that conference, it was July 21st when I was coming back. I was in Malvern, Pennsylvania. I took the Greyhound back to Minnesota and I made dua because I had, I could have stayed in New York with my grandma. I could have went to Texas. My sister was like, yo, even if you don't get accepted, still come to Texas. Or I could have went back to Minnesota. I made dua, Allah, whatever is best for me, tell me and I'll, and I'll go. Show me a sign. And I go to, um, I'm in New York. I'm, there was New York has a rule, it's $15 an hour is their minimum wage. But I'm from Minnesota, bro. Like I was, I was like, yeah, that's money, right? I'm young. I'm not I'm not getting money like that. So like, I'm like, yeah, that's good money. This Nordstrom place was, I think, like sixteen dollars an hour. I went to their interview. It was a Thursday, and I remember. Uh, so the thing is, it's the twenty fifth. I go to their interview, and I remember on my way back from that interview, I used to like download Netflix shows and I would watch it on the on my phone while I'm on the six train mm-hmm. back to Harlem because my grandma stayed in Harlem. While I'm watching the Netflix, bro, I get a email, bro. Wallahi, it says, I can literally show you the email right now. It says, you've been accepted, you wow. know, to Qalam, right? And I'm just like, oh, okay. Wow. Then um, I go and I tell my eyes, and then then I see with their how much money it costs. Mm. So I'm like, yo, I'm not paying that. It's a little like a mm. good amount of money, you know? I'm, I'm, right. I can't pay that. I'm not going to make my family pay something like that. Right. So I tell my sister I'm not going to go. Right. Anyways, more of the story, mm. right? She just said, you apply to the scholarship. I'm like, okay, I'm pl- applied to the scholarship. So I did, right? But I had no intention of going. So my sister keeps calling me, are you going to go? Are you going to go? Because she has a lease with other girls. And so she's like, I got to sign the lease by August 1st. August 1st comes around. I tell her, yo, sign that lease, bro. I'm not going to Texas. Because I didn't get the acceptance to the scholarship. I go back to Minnesota. August 11th was Eid. I came back the 12th. I was in Minnesota for about a week. I mean, when I go back to Minnesota, oh yeah, mind you, the Nordstrom job, they denied me. Okay. <laughs> you feel gotcha. me? So my grandma, she's like, you can go back if you want. I went mm. back to Minnesota. Okay. So now it's between Minnesota and Texas. Mm. I'm in Minnesota. How long ago was this, by the way? 2019. Okay. So at this point, I'm two months sober. Mm. 2019 goes by. I mean, 20, August the 12th, I go back. I start reconnecting with old friends doing the same thing. They all like stuck in that same, like they don't, we don't have the same perspective. So I kick it with them one time. And that one time was enough for me to say, yo, I don't want to stay in Minnesota. But I'm like, okay, well, at the same time, like, what should I do? Right? So I told my sister, I'm still thinking about Texas. Still praying, still making dua, bro. And alhamdulillah, like three days before, my sister left, I think like the 20 something, three days before the night, they gave me, they sent me the email saying I got accepted for the scholarship. So I went, but now what's the issue? I have nowhere to stay, nowhere to stay, bro. I went over there and nothing, you know what I mean? And alhamdulillah, like, bro, like, a lot just placed people in my life. There's a brother here from uh, Seattle, actually, his name is Akram. You know what I'm saying? He's one of the brothers that, like, he, he helped me out, bro. He allowed me for a place to stay. And it was, just, he didn't know me from a can of paint, just helped me out. You know what I mean? And those people, like Sheikh Mukayu, um, you, you know, Sheikh Mufti Kamani, there was people that were there that, like, bro, like, just were just helping me out. Just for, They didn't even know what was going on with me. You know what I mean? Sheikh Mikhail was probably the only one that knew at that time. You know, and then everybody, they learned kind of like later on when they spoke about it, but it was something that just continuously they were pouring into me. And alhamdulillah, that was only by the grace of God. And for that first beginning time, it was just lonely. I had to like make that decision like, yo, I gotta, I gotta change. But it was really just because of the fact of the matter that I really didn't want to die. That was the beginning. And then when my friends were dying, 
that's what did it for me where I was like, yo, I'm never going back to this. Right. I don't ever want to go back right. to it. I mean, you know. So that was the full, yeah. that was how you kind of went from wanting to change to feeling like you have to change or else you're going to die. I mean, there's no other ultimatum than that. Yeah, man, you get sober, right. bro. And then you, you know, I watched my homie's dead body, bro. Mm. Or two of them that died from that. Right. You know what I mean? I like how many, so like seeing that, it was like, it was so crazy, bro, because I'm just thinking that, like, every time I'm looking at them, like, even I'm talking to you right now, I'm mm. seeing their face, bro, like, mm. it's cold body, there's a smell mm. about, like, a dead body that never leaves you, bro. Oh, so it's like, you see them, and you're like, that could've easily been me. Right. My my body's gonna be that cold one mm. day. Right. And so, like, you just, in that deep thought of, like, yo, like, and so I think that's really what did it for me. Man, it's beautiful to hear how, mashallah, you changed your life but also you're changing the life of other people. I just really want you to know that Allah Mubarak, bro, the impact that you're making. Um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect, to preserve you, akhi, and to Ameen. accept your good Ameen. deeds, bro. Uh, mashallah, it's inspiring to see brothers like you doing this, bro. And and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it. Uh, I think for our audience, uh, where can they find about, like, your? I know you have books. You have a second book that you're coming up with, but you already have a book. Mm. Um and also, you're doing a tour. I don't, is it Seattle the last stop? You no, we got San Diego. And then we got other places. Okay. Um, but we're in just it's still kind of in the planning stage. Okay, got you, yep. got you. Yeah, yeah no, so. I'm, I got to pull up today. Yeah, pull up, man. I'm about to pull up. I'm about to pull up. Inshallah. 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 I wish I could, bro, but like, I got, got a camping camp. thing mm -hmm. last week. Somali's camping. That's crazy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Somali yeah. Somali camping. That's yeah. nice. Uh, but for sure, Inshallah, fam. So, what what's next for Abdurrahman, man? I'm really curious about that. How can we follow your journey? And, and thank yeah, you. man, you guys can catch a. Um, I mean, like I do post a lot on social media, so mm -hmm. my I, I handle Abdurrahman, uh, two two A's between the M and the N, okay. and like two underscores, I think. Or you can look at our organization's page, Generation Hope. It'll be down here. Yeah, there you go. For sure, it's yeah, easy. it's gonna be yeah. Down. Generation Hope M N. Um, we also have a YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, so for myself right now. I'm working on a few different things. Yeah. Uh, one of them is that book. I mean, it's like something that I, I've been working on, but it's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we working on a drop-in center right now, opening up a first ever like culturally specific drop-in center within the Somali community, mm -hmm. which is like kind of like a, a walk-in space for, for people that are struggling with addiction mm -hmm. um, and homelessness to get the services that they need. Mm -hmm. um, working on that. Um, we're gonna finish up this documentary tour and then we're gonna release it. Um, but really focus oh, on this organization work, like, um, it, it is really what we've been doing for now. And like, even more, more, impo like, importantly, now we're gonna be doing a lot more on the groundwork. That's what this drop in center is about. And this is what we've been working towards for a few years. Mm -hmm. And so, Alhamdulillah, like, that's that's really like what our biggest goal is, is making sure that people get those resources that they need. They need. Mm -hmm. um, but all of these other things are like also means to an end. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're trying to do is educate people mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, like I can continuously talk about this all day, mm -hmm. but the goal isn't just to, to talk, mm -hmm. right? It's like to get people to act. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that alone. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so like, it, even if it's like five, 10 of us, like we need a whole community mm -hmm. everywhere, you know, in every respective community. How can we, um, how can we have play our part, right? It's like that literally every single um, time we do the screening, mm -hmm. it's one of the biggest things that we talk about is like, okay, like, well, we came here. Well, I'm not from Seattle. Well, I'm not from Ohio. Mm -hmm. I'm not from Toronto. I'm not from San Diego. Mm -hmm. I'm not from um, London. All these other Somali communities, you know, that we're going to. And the, the last question that we always ask is, okay, well, what's going to happen when we leave? Mm -hmm. This is a conversation, but what can we do? What is our part to play? Yeah. And so like, let's figure that out. Mm -hmm. I like that for sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah, make sure you guys do follow the brother. Uh, we're gonna put his social media handles up on the screen and in the description. Be in the uh, That's true. And also, you know, this is a big conversation, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who we can get so much deeper into this. Mm -hmm. um, but mashallah, you do have content that's available. I know you have that that podcast, and I think for those who are probably wanting to go deeper into this, wanting to see a lived experience of others and how they overcame it. Yeah. Tap in there for sure. No, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And one thing for sure I learned was, Wallahi, like, I didn't expect to learn, like, a lot when I came here because it's like, I had to do a lot of research, like, for myself. But the one thing that I would say that I appreciate, like, thank you for actually coming and actually talking. And one thing I learned from you is, like, there's, like, 
there's always like the person that you love the most can go back to it to always check up on them. And that's yeah. one thing that I appreciate the most that I learned today. Mm, of course. So thank you for teaching me that. Well, appreciate I appreciate you, you, man. Yes, 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 for sure. All right, y'all. Inshallah, I hope you guys enjoyed. I want to say thank you again to our brother Abdurrahman. <laughs> for sure. You know, it's been honestly a pleasure to have him, mashallah. That's true, a lot. Allah Mabarak. So uh, for if you guys think this benefited you guys, make sure you guys go ahead uh, and share it to your family. Go ahead and spread the word. I think that's the number one thing we talked about. Mm -hmm. Education is key. Yep, yep. So, you know, go ahead and spread it to your relatives and, and get this uh, this word, this message, this conversation going, inshallah. Mm -hmm. And uh, make sure you guys go ahead and subscribe and follow the work of Brother Abdurrahman. Uh, sure. And uh, inshallah, we'll see you guys on the next episode. And if it pulls up to your city, pull up. Tap in. Yeah, <laughs>